Yeah. Talking freedom and liberation. Worldwide, not just only for the nation. A radical guy, it's time to make changes. Bringing interviews and radical education. Yeah, yeah, a better future. What we really Hello and welcome to a radical podcast where we bring you thought provoking content that challenges the status quo and explores the front lines of social, political, and environmental change. I am your host, Jason Bayless. In this episode, we delve into the intricate world of direct action, exploring its strategic nature and pivotal role in driving societal discourse and instigating change. We demystify what it entails, how it is organized, and what it hopes to achieve, taking you through the comprehensive process behind these well-planned strategies of resistance. We're also thrilled to announce the launch of our Radical Audiobook series, You'll hear more about this series and how it complements a radical podcast later in the episode. In our Radical and Anarchist News segment, we'll share a stirring report from Melbourne, Australia, where local hunt saboteurs rally support to oppose illegal hunting practices in the region. So please sit back and relax as we journey through these rich and critical discourses of direct action, education, and news from around the world. Let's go! This week in our Radical and Anarchist News segment, we bring you updates from the front lines of resistance. Today, we turn our attention to Melbourne, Australia, where a group known as Melbourne Hunt Sabs is making a call to action. Melbourne Hunt Sabs are a group of activists known as hunt saboteurs dedicated to disrupting and opposing local hunts. Hunt saboteurs are individuals who take direct action to interfere with hunting activities. They are now rallying for on-the-ground support at the local hunt's opening meet. The group's call to action is bold and clear. If you're in the area, they want you to join them and make your opposition to hunting heard. In a public statement, the Melbourne Hunt Saboteurs said, For the first time, we are asking for community and supporter presence at our first hunt sabotage without our founding sab, Liam. This is going to be a big one. We are determined not to let their abuse of power mean they can get away with hunting illegally. Are you annoyed at the hunt? Want to stand with Melbourne Hunt Saboteurs? They invite anyone who shares their concerns about hunting and animal cruelty to join them at the Barwon Hunt Club's official welcoming hunt on July 8th. This isn't just a simple gathering. It's a public protest against the club's illegal hunting methods, which they fear will be taught to others, including children. The protest will take place on July 8th, starting at 10 a.m., outside the Mount Hesse estate in Urak, the property where the hunt is set to take place. The Melbourne Hunt saboteurs plan to mark their presence with flags, so look out for those if you decide to join them. They've asked attendees to bring snacks, chairs, and most importantly, themselves for what promises to be an important day of action. Make some noise with us, they say, and they intend to make their opposition to hunting loud and clear. To those able to join them, your support will be valuable in challenging the norms of hunting in the region and showing solidarity with a group dedicated to protecting animals from cruelty. In standing with Melbourne Hunt saboteurs, you're helping to amplify their message and stand against the illegal and cruel practices associated with hunting. To wrap up, for those interested in learning more about the Melbourne Hunt saboteurs protest or other global direct action events and initiatives, you can visit the Unoffensive Animal website at unoffensiveanimal.is. This resource is an excellent way to stay informed and connected with various forms of resistance worldwide. Remember, whether you can join the protest in person, spreading the word and raising awareness about these actions also contributes to the cause. So, share this news within your networks and continue to stand together. Welcome to another Resistance Around the World segment, where we explore global movements and strategies for resistance and social change. Today, we're turning our attention to the concept of direct action. Direct action is a form of protest where activists directly confront or disrupt systems of power to bring about change. This method can take various forms and is not restricted to a binary of violent and nonviolent tactics. It encompasses a wide array of actions, from strikes, sit ins, and road blockades to hacking, sabotage, and property damage. It's essential to acknowledge that the term violent is frequently used by those in positions of power to discredit actions taken by activists. This label is applied even when these actions involve no physical harm to individuals, but instead focus on systemic disruption or nonviolent protest. That said, the spectrum of direct action includes violent acts. Propaganda by deed, for example, refers to specific political direct actions intended to serve as an example to others 
and as a catalyst for revolution. However, this episode will not focus on violent direct action such as propaganda by deed. Separate from propaganda by deed, violent actions are rooted in far-right and fascist ideologies, such as bombings by white nationalists or lynchings by white supremacists. While acknowledging their existence is essential, we want to clarify that these acts don't align with the principles of social justice and equality that direct action aims to uphold in its most constructive and meaningful form. Our intent is not to lend legitimacy or support to these harmful ideologies. Instead, our exploration of direct action will center on the varied tactics of activists and movements worldwide to disrupt oppressive systems and drive social change. In our exploration, we will encounter actions that leverage peaceful means to incite or advocate for change. These often involve symbolic acts of civil disobedience. In the context of our discussion throughout this segment, we will broadly categorize all these forms under the umbrella term direct action. However, when exploring specific tactics and strategies, especially those embodying nonviolent principles, we will add an appropriate descriptor to denote the specific nature of the action, such as nonviolent direct action. This clarification will allow us to delve into activists' nuanced strategies within the broad spectrum of direct action. Understanding this spectrum is critical to examining the diverse strategies activists around the globe employ in their quest for social change, whether we agree with their tactics or not. We will dive deeper into these different forms of direct action with historical examples that illustrate their varied uses and impacts. Let's begin exploring direct action by understanding what it truly entails. Direct action is a form of protest where individuals or groups directly confront or disrupt systems of power without the mediation of third parties, to bring about social, political, or environmental change. It's important to remember that direct action is not a new phenomenon, but a long-standing protest and resistance method. It has evolved and has been employed by different movements throughout history to achieve transformative change. For example, the non-cooperation movement led by Mahatma Gandhi in India effectively used the tool of civil disobedience, a form of direct action, to resist British colonial rule. At its core, direct action is guided by autonomy, direct involvement, and confrontation principles. It hinges on the desire to enact immediate change and disrupt prevailing systems of power. Activists who employ direct action often aim to directly impact the issues they're protesting against rather than appealing to representatives or mediators. Now let's delve into the different forms direct action can take, all falling under its broad umbrella. Civil disobedience. The act of breaking unjust laws is usually done in a peaceful and public way. This can involve sit-ins, trespassing, blockades, and other forms of non-cooperation. Strikes. This involves employees halting work to demand better working conditions, higher pay, or other benefits. There are also hunger strikes, where individuals refuse to eat to protest an issue. Boycotts. Here, the resistance comes from refusing to buy, use, or participate in goods or services, thereby putting economic pressure on businesses or organizations. Sabotage, a more destructive form of direct action where property or equipment is damaged or destroyed to hinder or stop specific actions. Environmental activism often uses this to prevent or slow down destructive practices. Protests and marches, large public gatherings that bring attention to a cause or issue involving speeches, chants, and signs. Blockades and occupations, these involve physically preventing access to a place or area, such as a building, road, or construction site, disrupting business as usual, or claiming a space for a cause. Direct aid or mutual aid. Providing help directly to those in need, such as through food banks, free clinics, or shelter for the unhoused. Guerrilla gardening. Planting and caring for gardens on land that is not legally owned by the gardener, such as vacant lots or road medians. Culture jamming subverting mainstream media messages and symbols to create new meanings, often to challenge consumerism or corporate power. Hacktivism, using digital tools and platforms to promote political ends, such as by disrupting websites, leaking information, or creating online protest spaces. Sit-ins, occupying a space to protest an issue or organization, often by sitting down and refusing to leave. Teach-ins, an extended meeting often held at a school or university to discuss a social or political issue. Die-ins, protest where participants simulate being dead, lying down silently, 
typically represents the deaths caused by a specific issue or cause. Tax resistance, refusing to pay taxes to protest government policies or actions. Tree sitting, activists sit in trees to prevent them from being cut down. Bike block, using bikes to slow or stop traffic to protest issues like climate change or promote alternative transportation modes. Creation of autonomous zones, designation and occupation of areas like streets, buildings, etc., where people try to establish self-governing communities as a form of protest. Mass resignations, when a group of workers or members of an organization all resign simultaneously to make a point or demand change. In pursuing social change, these diverse strategies provide activists with a broad arsenal of tactics to challenge and disrupt established power systems. Of course, while direct action has been instrumental in driving significant social and political shifts, it's also important to acknowledge its challenges and criticisms. Direct action can lead to legal repercussions and public disapproval and potentially escalate into violence. The effectiveness of direct action in achieving long-term change can also be a topic of debate. Despite these challenges, understanding direct action is crucial in today's context. Across the globe, activists harness the power of direct action to challenge injustice, inequality, and environmental destruction. These actions, whether they're strikes, sit-ins, hacktivism, or other forms of protest, demonstrate the resilience and creativity of the human spirit in the face of systemic issues. Now we will take a closer look at civil disobedience, one of the most powerful and historically significant forms of direct action. We will explore its roots and revisit some key historical examples that illustrate its transformative potential and enduring impact in shaping our world. Civil disobedience is a form of direct action that involves the deliberate and public violation of laws perceived as unjust. It is a deeply moral act, emphasizing that the legal does not always equate to the just. Instances of civil disobedience can be found throughout human history as people have consistently used it as a tool to challenge oppressive laws and societal norms. One such historical example comes from the 18th century, over a hundred years before the term civil disobedience was coined. British abolitionists, deeply opposed to the transatlantic slave trade, began what is now known as the sugar boycotts. These boycotts targeted the production of slave labor, specifically sugar from the West Indies. Many people refused to buy or consume the sugar, a direct disobedience of the economic laws and societal norms of the time. This tactic became a widespread form of protest and marked one of the first significant consumer boycotts in history. The term civil disobedience was later defined by American transcendentalist Henry David Thoreau in his 1849 essay, Resistance to Civil Government, where he argued it is the moral duty of individuals to resist unjust laws or governmental actions. This concept has since influenced many key figures and movements worldwide, including Mahatma Gandhi's independence struggle in India and the American civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. In essence, civil disobedience as a form of direct action involves challenging the established order by refusing to comply with specific laws or demands of the institutions of power. In recent history, civil disobedience has continued to play a central role in numerous movements for change. The civil rights movement in the United States, spearheaded by figures like Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and numerous others, frequently employed civil disobedience as a tactic. They knowingly and peacefully violated unjust segregation laws, sparking widespread protests and garnering significant media attention. This highlighted the injustices of segregation to a global audience and applied pressure on institutions of power to bring about legislative change. Similarly, the 1980s saw the rise of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, with figures like Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu leading the charge. A range of civil disobedience strategies, including strikes, boycotts, and non-cooperation, were employed to resist and eventually dismantle the racist system of apartheid. Over the past decade, the Black Lives Matter, BLM movement, has emerged as a powerful force advocating for racial justice and police reform. Civil disobedience has been a key strategy, with protesters engaging in peaceful yet disruptive activities. Demonstrations have ranged from solitary acts, such as professional athletes taking a knee during the national anthem, to collective actions like mass protests and marches. The I Can't Breathe silent protests are one poignant example. These were in response to the killing of Eric Garner in 2014, and again for George Floyd in 2020, 
both unarmed black men who died after police officers held them in a chokehold. During these silent protests, participants laid down in public spaces, simulating the victim's last moments, causing significant disruption. This form of civil disobedience drew national and international attention to the issue of police brutality and systemic racism. In all of these cases, civil disobedience was used to disrupt the status quo, challenge power structures, and push for change. Whether executed individually or collectively, these acts of civil disobedience were instrumental in highlighting societal injustices and mobilizing public sentiment for systemic change. As we've explored, civil disobedience has been a powerful tool in the hands of activists, fostering significant change over the centuries. But civil disobedience is just one aspect of a larger landscape of strategies that seek to challenge systems of power while consciously avoiding harm to individuals. That brings us to another transformative approach that has reshaped our understanding of what resistance can look like. Let's dive into the realm of nonviolent direct action, where power meets peaceful resistance, often leading to profound change. Nonviolent direct action, despite misconceptions of being passive or inactive, is a profound form of direct action that actively confronts and disrupts oppressive systems. It's not just the absence of violence, it's the presence of an active force for change deeply rooted in strategic planning, discipline, and principles of respect for all life. At its core, nonviolent direct action challenges the misconception that the only forms of resistance are either violence or inaction. Rather, it positions itself as an assertive, strategic, and creative third way. It seeks to create tension and highlight the injustices embedded within societal systems, forcing those in power and the wider public to confront these issues directly. James Lawson, Jr., an influential strategist during the American Civil Rights Movement, effectively applied these principles to advance the struggle for racial equality. His teachings, which deeply influenced groups like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, also known as SNCC, demonstrate how nonviolent direct action operates. Lawson drew from Christian thought, the teachings of Gandhi, and the rich history of nonviolent resistance worldwide to form a holistic view of nonviolence. His principles extended beyond the individual and emphasized community preparation, education, strategic planning, and discipline. For Lawson and the activists he trained, nonviolence was an active form of resistance. The goal was not to defeat an adversary, but to win them over through moral force and the power of persuasion. The tactics of nonviolent direct action are as varied as the context in which they're applied. The sit ins in Nashville provide an example of this approach. Activists, trained in nonviolent resistance, strategically planned sit ins at segregated lunch counters. They displayed discipline in the face of verbal and physical abuse, demonstrating their resilience and commitment to their cause. These actions aim to disrupt the oppressive segregation system and directly confront the public and power holders with the inherent injustice. Other methods can include boycotts, strikes, demonstrations, and civil disobedience, among others. All of these actions share a common thread. They involve an active and strategic confrontation with oppressive systems, carried out in a manner that respects the dignity of all involved, including opponents. By avoiding physical violence, these actions draw strength from moral authority and the ability to engage wider public sympathy. Nonviolent direct action, therefore, serves as a powerful means of resistance. It combines a deep respect for life with a firm resolve to resist injustice and oppression. As shown through the teachings of figures like James Lawson Jr. and the actions of countless activists worldwide, nonviolent direct action is a profound demonstration of the power inherent in disciplined, principled resistance. It stands as a testament to the strength of human resilience and the enduring pursuit of justice and equality. Let's move from the realm of peaceful protests to another form of resistance that sparks heated debates, actions that involve property damage. While nonviolent direct action emphasizes the sanctity of life and seeks to avoid harm, it doesn't necessarily mean that all forms of direct action are devoid of destructive elements. Now we will dive into a more contentious area where objects, not people, become the targets. These forms of direct action include property damage, and they have their unique place in the activism toolbox. Having examined the principles of nonviolent direct action, we now turn to another, often more contentious, form of direct action 
that involves property damage. This form of action is marked by intentional property damage or destruction, particularly targeting institutions or entities deemed to be perpetuating systemic injustices. Direct action involving property damage engenders complex ethical and strategic debates. Contrasting nonviolent direct action that prioritizes respect for all life, actions involving property damage pose challenging questions about the parameters of violence. Responses can be polarized, with some viewing such actions as a justifiable resistance to systemic injustice and others deeming it destructive and counterproductive. A look back in history provides examples of such actions. One significant historical example is the Boston Tea Party of 1773, an act of protest against the British government's tea tax, seen as unfair and imposed without American representation. Disguised protesters boarded ships and dumped chests of tea into the Boston Harbor, damaging substantial property but not harming any individuals. In contemporary times, the Earth Liberation Front, ELF, and the Animal Liberation Front, ALF, have employed similar tactics. ELF and ALF are underground movements that utilize direct action in the form of economic sabotage to stop perceived environmental and animal exploitation. They seek to inflict economic damage on those profiting from the destruction and exploitation of the natural environment and animals, while explicitly stating their commitment to avoid harm to humans and animals. In the recent Black Lives Matter protests against systemic racism and police brutality, instances of property damage also emerged as part of larger protests. Particularly notable was the burning of a police station, symbolically challenging the systemic racism inherent in policing institutions. It was not just an act of destruction, but a symbolic defiance of an oppressive system. These examples provoke intense debate about the effectiveness and ethics of property damage as a form of direct action. Advocates contend that it can expose systemic injustices, disrupt harmful practices, and instigate broader societal discussions. Critics counter that it can invite backlash, erode public support, and result in harsh legal repercussions. Like all forms of direct action, those involving property damage demand careful strategic consideration, acknowledging the potential consequences and the broader movement's goals. Such nuanced understanding enables us to appreciate the place of direct action involving property damage within the larger context of resistance strategies used throughout history and into our present day. Direct action has proven to be an indispensable tool in amplifying voices from the margins, empowering individuals and groups to take matters into their own hands, and command attention where they might otherwise be ignored. This assertion of agency is grounded in unity and collective strength. The impact of direct action can be both symbolic and practical. Symbolically, it disrupts the status quo and compels those in power to face the injustices they may wish to overlook. Practically, it can halt harmful activities, make oppressive practices more costly or challenging, and even lead to significant policy changes. But the effectiveness of direct action is not universal. It's shaped by strategic application, context, and the broader movement's ability to use the momentum it creates. Despite its potential for backlash or even alienation of potential allies, history has shown us that direct action is often indispensable to successful movements. It is the amplified voice for those demanding change, the disruptive force rattling oppressive structures, and the spark that ignites transformation. Let's dive into examples illustrating the potency and significance of direct action throughout history and various movements. Our journey begins with the civil rights movement in America. Here, direct action was crucial in confronting segregation and racial discrimination. The freedom rides, sit-ins, and bus boycotts were bold, direct challenges to oppressive systems. As civil rights leader Rosa Parks once said, I believe we are here on the planet Earth to live, grow up, and do what we can to make this world a better place for all people to enjoy freedom. These actions successfully amplified the urgency of the civil rights movement, leading to landmark legislation like the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. We then turn our attention to the world of environmental activism. Groups like Greenpeace, Sea Shepherd, and Earth Liberation Front have employed direct action to challenge environmental harm, stirring public awareness, and pushing for policy changes. Environmental activist Edward Abbey once remarked, Sentiment without action is the ruin of the soul. These environmental activists embody this sentiment. 
pairing their deep concern for the environment with tangible actions to protect it. Next, we delve into the fight for LGBTQ plus rights. Instances of direct action such as the Stonewall riots and ACT-UP's response to the AIDS crisis have been pivotal in shaping policies and fostering greater acceptance for the LGBTQ plus community. Marsha P. Johnson, a prominent figure in the Stonewall Uprising, once said, No pride for some of us without liberation for all of us. These words capture the spirit of direct action within the LGBTQ plus rights movement. We then examine the role of direct action within the labor movement. It has been a powerful tool for workers fighting for better conditions and fair pay. As a labor organizer, Mother Jones said, Mourn the dead and fight like hell for the living. This encapsulates the spirit of direct action in the labor movement, where actions often arise out of difficult conditions and seek tangible improvements. Finally, we turn to the role of direct action in anti-war protests. Tactics like draft card burning, sit-ins, and mass demonstrations have been used to disrupt the machinery of war and bring attention to the horrors of conflict. As anti-war activist Daniel Berrigan once said, one cannot level one's moral lance at every evil in the universe. There are just too many of them. But you can do something, and the difference between doing something and doing nothing is everything. This spirit of doing something has been at the heart of direct action in anti-war movements. Through these stories, we hope to provide a comprehensive understanding of how direct action continues to shape the course of history, acting as a powerful tool for social change. As we move deeper into our exploration of direct action, it's essential to understand its symbolic nature. It's a form of communication that transcends the physical act itself, often challenging prevailing narratives and social norms, pushing the boundaries of what's considered acceptable or legal. In its diverse forms, direct action is a medium through which marginalized communities, activists, and movements articulate their resistance, demands, and visions for a more just society. It's a way for them to tell their stories on their terms, disrupting the monopoly of dominant voices. For instance, consider the iconic image of a protester placing a flower in a soldier's rifle during an anti-war demonstration. That singular act carries a potent symbolic message, a peaceful challenge to the narrative of violence, and a visual representation of the struggle for peace. In the same vein, when environmental activists scale industrial chimneys to unveil banners demanding climate action, their act is about more than just the potential to halt production momentarily. It's about disrupting business as usual, visually representing the dire urgency of the climate crisis and challenging the narrative prioritizing profit over the planet. The sit-ins during the civil rights movement were not just about occupying physical space. They were a defiant declaration against racial segregation, a public display of resilience, and a challenge to the narrative of racial inferiority. Even the controversial tactics of property damage, when employed by groups like the Earth Liberation Front, carry a symbolic dimension. Targeting entities they perceive as destructive to the environment disrupts the narrative that such entities can act with impunity and make visible the often overlooked ecological costs. Through these actions, activists are rewriting the rules, calling out systemic injustices, and challenging society to question and change its ways. They utilize the symbolic power of direct action to amplify their voices, raise public consciousness, and compel a response from those in power. However, this approach is not without risks. By challenging the status quo, activists can face backlash from those who uphold it. Moreover, not all observers interpret these symbols in the intended way. Even so, the ability to challenge dominant narratives in such a visible and impactful manner is one of the potent aspects of direct action. In the end, direct action is a compelling mix of the concrete and the symbolic, the physical and the narrative. It's a tool that, when wielded with understanding and intent, can both highlight the invisible and provoke tangible change. Direct action is not a spontaneous or random act. It's a meticulously planned and executed strategy aimed at exacting social, political, or environmental change. The development of direct action is a thoughtful process that requires a high degree of organization, a clear understanding of the cause, and a strategy for mobilizing and protecting participants. Now let's delve deeper into these steps. The first phase usually involves identifying a target or issue to address. This can range from specific laws or policies to broader societal norms. Organizers also identify points of intervention, places in a system where a targeted action can interrupt the system's functioning, 
and create opportunities for change. These points of intervention vary depending on the system in question, but to help you understand these points, I will define each point of intervention. Points of production, the places where a system or process produces something, such as a factory. Actions here often involve strikes, work slowdowns, or factory takeovers. Points of destruction, the places where a system or process causes harm or injustice, such as a strip mine or a landfill. Actions can halt the act of destruction and draw attention to the issue. Points of consumption, the locations where a product or service linked to injustice is used or purchased, such as a retail store. Actions here often involve consumer boycotts or storefront demonstrations. Points of decision, the locations where the power to act on a campaign's demands rests, such as a corporate boardroom or a state capital. Actions here apply pressure directly on the decision makers. Points of assumption. These are the ideological underpinnings of a system, often unexamined, that maintain the status quo. Actions here seek to expose and challenge these assumptions, creating shifts in belief systems. Points of opportunity. These are calendar or event-based opportunities that can be leveraged to draw attention to a cause, such as a national holiday or a high-profile visit. Identifying these points of intervention helps in the strategic planning of direct actions, allowing organizers to target the system effectively and maximize the impact of their actions. Once a target and the points of intervention are identified, organizers work on developing an action plan. This involves determining the form of direct action, such as a sit-in at a point of a decision like a corporate boardroom or a boycott at a point of consumption like a retail store. The choice of tactics is often tailored to the specific context of the struggle. It can be influenced by factors such as the movement's resources, the legal environment, and the potential risks to participants. Mobilizing participants is a crucial part of this planning process. Organizers often contact their networks, leveraging social media and other communication tools to recruit volunteers. They may also provide training sessions to prepare participants for the action teaching them nonviolent resistance techniques, briefing them on legal rights, and preparing them for potential encounters with law enforcement or counter-protesters. Safety considerations are paramount in planning direct actions. Organizers need to consider the participants' physical safety, especially if there's a risk of confrontation or violence. This can involve arranging for legal observers to be present, providing protective gear, or planning for medical aid if needed. The legal implications of the planned actions are also a crucial consideration. Organizers typically familiarize themselves with these implications, allowing them to inform participants of potential consequences, plan for legal support, and strategize on leveraging any legal fallout in service of their cause. The planning and execution of direct actions illustrate the commitment and dedication of activists to their causes who are willing to risk personal safety and legal consequences for the betterment of society. It underscores the strategic and thoughtful nature of direct action as a tool for social change. As we wrap up, we explored how direct action serves as a critical tool for those resisting oppressive systems and fighting for change worldwide. Whether it's standing in solidarity on the front lines of a protest, engaging in a sit-in at a corporate headquarters, or challenging the status quo through a well-timed intervention, the strategies we've explored in this segment illustrate the dynamic and strategic nature of direct action. Understanding the ins and outs of direct action, from its conceptual basis to its practical execution, helps us recognize the immense dedication, courage, and resourcefulness of the people and movements behind these actions. Moreover, it provides insight into the complexities and realities of the grassroots struggle for change. From points of production to points of assumption, we see a concerted effort to disrupt to challenge, and to transform. But the story doesn't end here. Each direct action is a part of a broader narrative, a larger fight against systemic issues, and a step towards a more just and equitable world. As we continue to witness resistance across the globe, let us remember the power of direct action and its impact on shaping our world. Finally, as we reflect on the importance of direct action in social movements, we must acknowledge that every act of resistance, regardless of its size or scope, contributes to the greater tide of change. We hope this deep dive into the world of direct action 
has equipped you with a better understanding of its strategic nature and its pivotal role in shaping societal discourse and instigating change. So, as we continue to witness, participate in, or stand in solidarity with these movements, let us carry forward the lessons of direct action in our pursuit of a better world. Radical education, yeah, yeah, a better future, what we really need, not rooted in capitalism or supremacy. We're thrilled to announce the launch of a radical audiobook series, a platform designed to inspire intellectual curiosity, challenge established norms, and promote a deeper understanding of alternative societal structures. Our inaugural title in a radical audiobook series is Mutual Aid, a Factor of Evolution, by the influential anarchist Peter Kropotkin. His insightful work offers a deep dive into the ideas of cooperation and mutual aid as natural and necessary components of evolution, both biologically and socially. We believe that these thought-provoking works, carefully curated, can act as a catalyst for change, prompting you to question, explore, and seek out new perspectives. In addition, we'll be using a radical podcast to supplement these audiobooks, offering an in-depth exploration and analysis of the concepts presented. The podcast will provide a platform for further discussion, critical thinking, and engagement with the ideas and themes brought up in the audiobooks. To learn more about the series and subscribe, please visit us at aradicalguide.com. While you're there, we also invite you to contribute to our growing community. You can add your favorite Radical location to our site by clicking the Add a Listing button. Your input helps us build a more comprehensive guide, expanding our reach and fostering a global network of Radical thought. Supporting a Radical guide doesn't just end there. By contributing financially, you help keep this project running, ensuring that we can continue to bring you enlightening content, stimulating discussions, and a platform for Radical ideas. Whether through financial contributions, sharing our content, or engaging with our community, every bit of support helps us bring these important ideas to the fore. Let's go! Don't forget to check out our Radical audiobook inaugural title, Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution, by Peter Kropotkin. Remember, these curated works are not just about passive listening. We hope they serve as stepping stones for your intellectual exploration, challenging perspectives, and deepening your understanding of alternative societal structures. In our news segment, we highlighted the call to action from Melbourne Hunt Saboteurs. If you want more information or want to stay updated on various forms of resistance happening worldwide, make sure to visit the Unoffensive Animal website at unoffensiveanimal.is. Remember, everyone has a part to play in pursuing a more just and equitable world. Whether that's joining a direct action, reading a radical book, or supporting initiatives like a radical guide, every effort contributes to the broader struggle for change. Before we sign off, if you know of a radical location you'd like to share with our community, visit a radical guide's website and click the add a listing button. Your contributions help us grow our collective knowledge and shared histories. Finally, if you found value in today's episode, we would love your continued support. You can subscribe to our YouTube page, sign up for our newsletter, and follow us on your preferred platform for podcasts and audiobooks. And if you're in a position to do so, consider contributing financially to a radical guide. Your contributions through engagement and financial support help keep this project running and accessible to all. Thank you for joining us on this journey today, and we look forward to having you with us on the next episode of A Radical Podcast. Until then, stay radical. Yeah, talking freedom and liberation Worldwide, not just only for the nation A radical guide, it's time to make changes Bringing interviews and radical education Yeah, yeah, a better future, what we really need Not rooted in capitalism or supremacy Yeah, yeah, trust, you don't want to miss it We bring the truth right to you The past, present, and future, let's go A radical guide, that's what this is Highlighting the diverse world of resistance Let's go